and welcome to The Nonprofit Show. We are so glad that you're here. Today we have what I like to consider a conversation that we haven't had much of in the last 800 plus episodes. So Dan Klatt is our guest today, the man of the time, the man of the hour. Excited to have you here. Um, Dan, you're known as the church guy, which I love that. Um, And you're going to talk to us about church space needs and real estate. So stay with us because as I said, this is not something that Julie and I have really touched on before. So it's a new conversation, uh, which we didn't think was possible, but here it is. So Julia Patrick has the day off today. We wish her well so she can continue to do well. Uh, Julia Patrick is the CEO at the American Nonprofit Academy. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group and honored to serve as a co-host on the nonprofit show. I know a lot of people say to us, uh, Dan, like, I cannot believe you've done this day in and day out since March of 2020. And sometimes I say, I can't believe that either. But here we are. Thank you to our amazing presenting sponsors that allow us these opportunities, which I really have grown to love. So when I'm not on the show and I'm not part of the conversation, I genuinely miss it. So a huge shout out of gratitude to our friends, our investors, our supporters, Um, our partners. So thank you to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, as well as nonprofit tech talk. We are so glad to have them um, supporting us in this episode and every episode. So thank you so much for that. Um, If you haven't checked out all of our episodes, you can do that. We stream on many uh, platforms, including Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, Vimeo. And for those of you that are podcast listeners, you can queue us up wherever you stream your podcast as well. Um, I know I start my day every single day. um, Yes, with a nonprofit show, but also with a podcast. So please join us there. Without further ado, so excited to welcome you officially to the nonprofit show, Dan. Uh, Those of you watching and listening, Dan Klatt joins us. He is the church guy. So welcome, Dan. So glad to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. I've been enjoying the show since I met you uh, last month. Well, thank you. And a, and a nod to Cami for the introduction. You know, many of our guests introduce us to other amazing guests, and you're one of them. But if you would start us off telling us a little bit about yourself um, and how you became the church guy. Well, I'll keep it short because we have a short time, but ended up with the real estate because I thought I wanted to be a business broker, and I hated it. I was on my way out of real estate, and my pastor called me and said, the board decided to sell our church. You can list it for us, can't you? Okay. And I was like a torn inside, but I thought it would be a good project to bridge me from this business broker to some other type of career. So, yeah, I'll do the project. And, uh, I took it on in my life. Wow. I can't imagine because it's a little bit different, I would think, from other real estate. I've not gone through any real estate training, but what I've heard, right, is there's a lot of I's to dot, a lot of T's to cross. And I can't imagine, you know, between commercial real estate, residential real estate, does church fall, where does church fall within those two? Or is that a separate category? No, it's a commercial real estate product. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's extremely unique. There's there's not just a few differences. There are so you've really, that's very interesting. So you've really made a name for yourself, obviously, and you know, I'm really the church guy. So you work across the nation. And when you and I chatted, uh, Dan, I really enjoyed learning about you and the team that you have. So you have a team, is that right? That also serves the nation? Yeah, we have about 104 agents uh, that we're working with, and some don't have church deals, but about 30 or 40 percent of them have uh, church projects they're working with, and I'm coaching them through the project. Okay, well, let's get um, very interesting. Let's get started in this, and the first question is, why is it so hard to find church property? What are, what are you seeing for this? Is there even church property available or is it like, you know, a dime a dozen or what are you seeing for this? Um, there are few, very few empty churches to be uh, purchased. 
And the ones that are empty are typically very old and don't have sprinklers in them. And it because the parking is too limited. But the, the general answer, and it, because so we convert office products. But the general answer to your question is usually parking is the big challenge, is our big number one challenge. Uh, many of the churches that were built years ago in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we didn't drive so much. We didn't have as many cars. We didn't need those big parking lots. But we were very mobile. So that's what creates the biggest part of our team. And, and how has that shifted uh, with COVID? March of 2020, I know when I you know shared with you, I have yet to step foot into my church, right? Because there's still so much of that streaming capability. And let's be honest, I can go to just about any church that still has that streaming capability. So I'm curious if you've seen an increase of church properties since March of 2020. Yeah, there has been certainly a uh, fallout from that. Uh, yeah. We've seen uh, more than I expected. Um, so, really? yeah. Is there any particular region that you see like getting hit harder than others? I'm just curious as you and your team serve across, you know, uh, the states, is there any particular area that you're seeing a higher increase of this? Yeah, the East and the Northeast. Interesting. More, yeah. Okay. Well, and the other thing I see, um, you know, and I saw this during the height of COVID as well, is capital campaigns and the improvement for churches. And so, you know, really learning all about this is just fascinating to me because it is such a niche market. And as you said, you know, they don't come up often, but when they do, you know, it takes takes a special touch on this. So talk to us about the preparation for purchasing church property. Is this something that it's a normal transaction, uh, just as, you know, many of us, maybe if we've purchased a home, would expect to go through. Talk to us about the preparation of this and what we need to consider when purchasing church property. Sure. The the main thing uh, that you got to do is have a down payment. And that's a challenge for a lot of churches. Sometimes it takes years to save up that down payment. And, um, but as far as buy, like you mentioned buying a home, buying a church is similar in some way. The income, the income to cash flow, they don't want the mortgage to be more than 30% of your, your regular cash flow. Same thing going to buy a home. They don't want your mortgage to be more than 30% of your personal cash flow. Yeah. And uh, so, and then they look at um, as far as ability track record you want to go back three years uh, the bank want to go back three years before you're really prepared um but one thing that we do is we evaluate um, a church congregation to determine what they actually need rather than buying what they want which is usually a bigger than what they need, um, so that they can be financially responsible uh, in their and and that's just being a good steward and being responsible with all the money that people have done over. Yeah. I'm curious, Dan, um, because I've seen this happen in nonprofits, is you know, um, the leader, the founders, I'm going to, I'm going to start back in the beginning, right? Really the founders that they will get uh, credit or purchasing power based off of their individual credit and purchasing power. When it comes to really purchasing church property, I would imagine this would be the congregation or the church's like business entity, if you will, are we coming off of their, you know, entity purchasing power? Um, or is this ever tied to individuals? It's never tied to individuals. There's never any personal guarantees or anything like that. It is based off of flow and stability. Okay. Um, so lending to churches is a whole art in it as well as the real estate. There are only a number of, all number of banks that will lend to church because it's so specialized. Talk to us about that because I, I love that you you had the foresight to go there because that was going to be my follow-up question is, you know, what are these financial institutions? And I know right now as we're recording this and talking about this live, we've had in our nation some financial institution upset. So is this a risk? And again, what are those institutions that do tend to focus on this niche market? 
So it's not necessarily a high risk Martin market, but you just have to learn about how to insure it and and okay. a lot or how I'm how to lend to it. In terms, but um, because again you have to figure out what they need and what they should have rather than what they want because collectively um, uh, collectively a church is an individual we always want a little bit more than we can afford um and so we have to read their expectations yeah uh, i feel like there needs to be um I mean, I'm going to call out HGTV because that's what I, I love to watch as well. But there needs to be like a buy, sell or trade, maybe, you know, church guy um, episode. I think that that would be very interesting to see and to watch, you know, how this tra transpires um, and how it transpires in different regions with different people, which me takes me to the people who who is involved in purchasing this church property. Does there need to be like. Um, a task force created by the church board. Um, who's involved with this, as well as your, you know, your real estate providers? Who's part of the conversations and the transaction? So usually it's the pastor and one or two of his leadership team. Okay. Uh, not necessarily the whole leadership team, but eventually we get there. As uh, as you know, with nonprofits, there are layers of approval. That you get you have to climb the ladder yeah. and and you get an, an approval and then it goes to the next step and then you get another approval and, and you're fine and so um it's uh on that way you know i always say that approval process is hurry up and wait it's like hurry up and wait hurry up and wait <laughs> so talk to us about the timeline um what would be on average i'm sure they're all different i've i bought a couple of homes in in my life already and i know that my residential transactions you know vary but what are you seeing by way of timeline so if there's someone watching and listening and they're thinking you know i would like to purchase a church property is this something that we can consider within the next 12 months 6 months or do we need to think further so yeah, our deal cycles, whether you're buying or selling, have they they kind of take the same amount of time, and okay. it's usually eighteen to twenty four months. Eighteen to twenty four. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. So I would consider then, you know, for for many of these churches, if they're doing a strategic plan or thinking about a capital campaign, you know, looking at that eighteen to twenty four month, that is quite. I don't know. That's quite a. a a, a timeline because there's a lot I'm sure that changes and as you said maybe properties are coming on the market maybe they're not coming on the market but that 18 to 24 month is a really good um I think benchmark of knowledge to know so that we can we can plan get everyone involved get our financials in order you know and really truly prepare for that so I feel like we might have asked this question or should have asked this question earlier, but I'm curious if you can talk to us, Dan. And I feel like, you know, also it's a really big um, open-ended answer here. This could be an episode in and of itself, but would you talk to us about what charitable real estate is? Charitable real estate is, I think it comes mainly when people want to leave a legacy. Uh, we, uh, we assist in helping churches set up legacy programs and nonprofits set up, uh, avenues, nonprofits that don't gifts of real estate. But when, when Aunt Elsie dies and she has a cabin in Utah and you live in Texas and you really don't have any in the cabin and you really don't need any extra money, but you'd like to just donate it that's the perfect uh the perfect vehicle. so you donate it to your church or your favorite nonprofit, and um and so we assist in processing that we take that property when it's donated we turn it into cash, and we give about 92 percent over 90 percent of the money back to the nonprofit. Wow. and that's pretty cool it's neat to be a service like that Absolutely. And I and I'm sure you mentioned earlier your team. How many agents again do you have working with you, Dan? 104. 104. And this is is this all that they do, or do they diversify in other properties? I think I heard you say a percentage of their portfolio is church properties. 
Right. So they're real estate professionals that needed help with or learning how to do church because they they have a need or they would like or in, they have an interest and they just don't know what to do, don't know the first thing. So many of the agents had got a hold of me and said, I have this church that wants me to do so and so, and I just don't know what the first step is. But I, I mean, I just don't know what to do. Help yeah. them. And so I join up with them and yeah, no, I I love that you're there as that resource. I mean, from the nonprofit nerd to the church guy, right? Like it's just we've definitely we know our market, uh, we know what we're here, as you said, you know, to to be a servant and to serve in that way. I'm curious, and we love this question. Um, you know, what do you see as the forecast going forward? There's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to the economics. I mean, this is, if Dan had a crystal ball, right? What would that crystal ball tell him um, with the foresight and the foreshadowing of the future? What are you predicting will we'll see, will happen, especially within our faith-based communities? Well, I, you know, faith-based communities thrive when trouble. Um, a lot of churches found new members during COVID. Yeah. Whether it was on Zoom or those that were able to meet in, in person in various states, they were able to meet in person throughout most of COVID. Um, and so there was a little bit of growth stimulated by COVID in personal, personal growth. There was um, cleansing, I don't know if you would call it a cleansing or a purging of smaller, weaker churches that that died off. But those people went elsewhere. Yeah. And so and and also people that weren't going to church started going because they were facing you know, many people they were facing death. And uh, so uh, actually we had about a three percent growth during COVID in our in my own church. Wow. And did you see that also transpire into an increase of financial support and resources? Because I'm curious if that kind of goes along with the congregation or the membership. Um, I know we can all give and tithe at different levels, but I'm really curious if, you know, you also saw an increase that was kind of parallel to that when it came to the financial support. Yes. Yeah, so I wasn't, I was speaking to the fund increase in finances the the congregation was split up between zoom and church it was hard to count uh, it was you know but we when we were able to meet again um we finally have now surpassed pre-covid number and uh, so yeah it's covid i i hate to say this because i know it's not true for every church but covid was actually good for our church yeah you know, that's fascinating. There's been a lot of silver linings, as I would recall as well, you know, when it comes to uh, to the global health pandemic. And I do think because we're in, you know, such a polarized state of mind, um, it, you know, across our nation, across our globe, really, we're also leaning in, we're craving community, we're craving um, you know, to know that we're not alone, we're craving that interaction and connection. And whether it's done in person, whether it's done, you know, through a virtual community, I too have seen a huge, what I would consider a huge uptick, right, of, of connectivity of different groups, uh, both face faith based and non faith based. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. Do you think that it's here to stay? Yeah, COVID? No, the 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 connection, like the increase yeah. to the faith base. Like, do you think that we'll start to see that taper off um, over the years, or do you think it's here to stay? I think it's here to stay for a while um, yeah. because I am hearing little bits of increased energy um, all over the country. Good. And uh, that's all. Awesome. Yeah, and I too have seen an increase in capital campaigns, as we mentioned, you know, earlier, in particular for churches and uh, the faith-based organizations, and looking at how they can better serve, probably an increased congregation or membership. Um, you know, how can we make uh, the property more accessible? The the car parking, you know, situation. There's so much that goes on with that. 
Um, this has been just fascinating, Dan, and I'm curious, and a lot of this conversation, as, as I told you, you know, it's very unscripted. We just open up, we have a conversation, and because this is a topic that the nonprofit show has not really dug into in the past, I'm curious if you could talk to us a little bit, um, if we wanted to sell a property, how that might be different, because we talked about the purchasing, we talked about the preparation. What if we are one of those churches or congregations that says, you know, we've held on as long as we could through the pandemic, we're barely scraping by, uh, we would actually like to consider selling. Do you and your agents help as well with the selling of properties? And what does Absolutely. that mean? Like? Okay, great. So the good news is um, you don't have to fix up a church. You um, you can sell it as is. Okay. The, the people coming in have all kinds of ideas on what you want to do to it anyway. So it would be a lot of wasted money. So that's one thing I would recommend. Don't fix anything uh, unless it's something mechanical that doesn't work, like an air conditioner or a plumbing leak or those kinds of things. But um, don't worry about any cosmetic or functionality of or swing or anything like that yeah. it'll be fixed up um, so that makes it easy the hard part is being in the waiting room that 18 to 24 months is a long time a long it um and the only the only way that you can speed that up is dropping the drop directly you sacrifice all that money right. so it's a it's kind of a tightrope walk Oh, wow. Well, there's a lot to think about, but I'm so glad to know that you and your team, uh, you know, really here to help with the charitable real estate, here to help with the, the transactions. Um, as you heard, Dan, the church guy, he has agents across the nation. So no matter where you're located in the U.S., someone can assist you. Um, and Dan will see to that. So Dan, you had mentioned your web address. Would you mind uh, telling our viewers and listeners where we can find more about you? Yeah, uh, my email is dan at churchguide.net and our web address is churchguide.net. Perfect. Well, I have a feeling there's going to be some people listening to this, sharing this episode. Um, as a reminder, you know, Julie and I, we provide these uh, conversations each and every day. I'm so glad to be of service uh, to you, to the topic, honestly, Dan, to talk about this. I'm so very grateful to have the support from our many presenting sponsors. Just a few hours after today's live conversation that we're having at this moment, uh, this episode will be woven into um, all of our platforms. And I want to say thank you, because the reason we're able to do this is because of our presenting sponsors. So huge shout out of gratitude and thanks go to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. Please check these companies out because they're here to help you. They're here to support you. And Dan, again, I'm so glad to have you here. It's such a niche market, um, something that we haven't talked much about. You know, we've talked about charitable real estate, but there's a whole nother sector within our nonprofit sector, you know, of churches that require a little bit more handholding in certain scenarios and the purchasing and the um, the selling of the properties is definitely one of them. So, so glad to know that you're you're here in our corner, Dan. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah, and thanks for all you do and your your agents do to serve our community. Uh, we're all in this together, and. I hope that you have a fantastic day. I hope all of you have enjoyed this conversation. If there's someone that you think needs to know about it, please share, let them know. Um, and again, as we end every episode, we like to remind you, our viewers, our listeners, our guests, um, to please stay well so you can continue to do well. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. 